Therefore, it is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, yesterday at the international plowing match, I heard one thing over and over again, and the question is, is for the Premier, because I'm sure she heard this too. What, what we heard was that the Liberal Band-Aid solutions do not go far enough to address the hydro crisis in Ontario. Rural Ontario has had a few solutions. They want this government to stop signing contracts for energy we don't need, and they want this government to stop the fire sale of Hydro One. So, Mr. Speaker, was the Premier listening yesterday? Will she make that commitment to rural Ontario? Very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we uh, we were very clearly listening. It was uh, it was great to be able to uh, attend the the plowing match, Mr. Speaker, and connect with people from uh, all over the province and from uh, outside of the province, Mr. Speaker, because our agriculture industry and our agri food industry are so important to the economy of this province and to the culture in uh, in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and. You know, Mr. Speaker, I did talk to uh, to people about uh, electricity rates. I talked about it in my uh, my comments, Mr. Speaker. And one of the things that one of the things that is really important to remember, Mr. Speaker, is that we have just come through one of the hottest summers ever, and we've had no blackouts, no brownouts, and no smog days, Mr. Speaker. And those those are because those are because of choices. Those are because of choices that we have made. And I will. Uh, I'll certainly elaborate in the uh, in the supplementary, Mr. Supplementary. Speaker. Mr. Uh, Speaker, back to the Premier. Nicole Prodhome from Ingersoll is a single working mother of three. She also takes care of her mother. She received a hydro bill of fifteen hundred dollars. The Liberal Band-Aid solution means she would still pay fourteen hundred dollars. That's absurd, Mr. Speaker. This government's plan is too little, too late to help individuals in rural Ontario. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier tell Nicole that a $1,400 or a $1,500 hydro bill is acceptable? Because I absolutely think it's not. It's not right. Families can't afford it. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, as I said, we have made a lot of uh, changes in the electricity system that mean it is clean and reliable, Mr. Speaker. But we recognize, we recognize that there is a cost associated with those changes, Mr. Speaker, and we have moved to. to Premier. And we've moved to take costs out of the system and to reduce electricity bills. So, Mr. Speaker, I don't know the situation of the particular person that uh, that the leader of the opposition is talking about, but I do know that the Ontario Energy Support Program, Mr. Speaker, for low-income families was already is already in place, Mr. Speaker, and that is uh, that is a program Answer. that people can apply to. We've gone further. We are reducing uh, electricity bills, Mr. Speaker, particularly in rural areas, Thank to you. the tune of 20 percent, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, no one believes for a second that this government is reducing electricity bills. So, Mr. Speaker, this is more than simply one family. So, I've got another question, Mr. Speaker, for the Premier. We can call this part of the Liberal math test. If, since 2013, there Start the clock. Finish, please. So, Mr. Speaker, another Liberal math uh, test question. If, since 2013, there are over 94,000 more households that are in arrears on their hydro bills, pushing that number in Ontario to an astonishing 567,000 individuals that can't afford their hydro bills, and if the Liberals raise rates as expected again on November 1st, how many Ontarians are going to be unable to afford their Question. hydro bill? Can we have an answer, Thank Mr. You. Speaker? Thank you. You see the you see the Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. People in Ontario need to be able to count on an electricity system that's clean and reliable. People in Ontario need to be able to pay their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker, which is why we have put in place. Finish, please. Why we already have the Ontario Energy Support Program, which is why we are taking the provincial portion of the HST off electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. Why we are putting an we are giving an additional 12% reduction on rural communities, Mr. Speaker. People also need to be able to find childcare, Mr. Speaker, which is why we have committed to creating 100,000 new childcare spaces. People in Ontario also need to be able to afford post-secondary education, which is why tuition will be free for. <coughs> Some of you may figure out that I'm trying something, and if that's not successful, I'll move to warnings. Finish. Which is why tuition will be free for low and uh, low middle income families starting next September, Mr. Speaker. I'm now moving to warnings. Finish. All the things I've talked about, Mr. Speaker, are things that we are doing to help people Answer. every day in their lives to afford the things that they need in their families. Those are the Thank that's you. the focus of what we are doing, Mr. Speaker. Question the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Since I can't get an answer on the Liberal hydro crisis, let's start with something else. I know the Premier saw the headline last week in the Toronto Star, which read, Expert panel was dismayed by Liberals' plan to put age cap on autism services. Parents of children with autism need to hear the truth. But members of the expert panel can't speak out. They are being muzzled by this government. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier lift the veil of secrecy and waive the confidentiality agreements? Simple question, yes or no. Mr. Speaker, I am very grateful to people like Bruce McIntosh, who is part of the advisory committee. I've had many meetings uh, with him, Mr. Speaker. He's part of the uh, advisory group, and I know that the minister has talked with the advisory group. The minister and I have talked, and of course, as those deliberations are underway, Mr. Speaker, it's perfectly reasonable that uh, members of the group would be able to talk about those deliberations. So I know that the minister is having that conversation with the advisory group about how to talk about those discussions that are necessarily uh, uh, confidential in the first place, Mr. Speaker, but how to talk about the decisions that come out of those uh, discussions and how to talk about that in the public realm, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier, and I, and I didn't get an answer in that. The government always seems to be hiding something. They've muzzled the expert panel, and now they're trying to muzzle parent activists. Bruce McIntosh, as the Premier mentioned, has been a tireless advocate and le led the fight for this government to recognize that autism services, autism doesn't end at five. But to be part of that new advisory panel, the government made Bruce McIntosh sign a confidentiality agreement. This government is scared of what he might say. Mr. Speaker, will this government promise that Bruce McIntosh can continue his fight? Will they promise he won't be muzzled? Yes or no? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, people, Bruce McIntosh has been, a, Bruce McIntosh has been a, an advocate on this, uh, on this issue for 20 years. When I was the Minister of Education, Mr. Speaker, he was, uh, he was part of a leading uh, group, and, and I know that the former Ministers of Education and Ministers of Children and Youth Services all have had interactions with, uh, with Bruce and, and, his, uh, and his, uh, um, his associates. And Mr. Speaker, Members of the advisory group do speak to the media. They will continue to speak to the media. And as I said, the Minister of uh, uh, Children and Youth Services is working with them to determine how to, how to talk about the deliberations in public. So, Mr. Speaker, it is really important that those, those conversations take place because as we roll out the new supports to families, and I, you know, Mr. Answer. Speaker, I will, uh, I will talk about a specific story in, uh, in the next supplementary, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Mr. Speaker, surprise, surprise, no answer on the confidentiality agreements. You know, last week when I asked how many families received the new funding, the government told me three things. First, they wrote a letter. Second, they set up a 1-800 number. Third, they held a press conference to make the announcement of a transition period, none of which gives families help. So, Mr. Speaker, I will ask again. 
How many families that were kicked off the waitlist have received the promised funding? Has there been any funding delivered to the families of, of those kicked off the waitlist by the Liberals? Any funding at all? Yes or no? Thank you. Speaker, families have already started receiving the $10,000, so the answer is yes. yes. They have, have, the they have begun to get the money, Mr. Speaker, and the story I wanted to tell was a mom who came up to me and told me that her child, who is a toddler, was told she was told that it was going to be a year and a half before she would get IVI treatment, Mr. Speaker, before she would get the support that she needed. What has happened because of the changes that we have made is that she's starting that treatment right now, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. She's getting that treatment a year and a half earlier. So that's exactly the result that we need to see. People are starting to get money. Uh, kids who were going to have to wait for program and treatment are actually getting that treatment now. That was the intention, and that's the impact that the changes are having, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, uh, two weeks ago, the Premier said that Ontarians would get a break on their hydro bills. People were hopeful that things would change, but instead of taking the HST off bills, the government is creating a rebate that we all know could disappear at any time. And instead of being just the first step to get bills down, it seems to be the only step, Speaker. People hoped for so much better. Will the Premier take action to get bills under control and stop the privatization of Hydro One? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I, I actually would have thought that the leader of the third party would have been very supportive of what we're doing, which is a permanent removal of the provincial portion of the HST from uh, electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's not uh, a rebate in the sense that people have to pay and then they will be paid back. It is coming right off the bills, Mr. Speaker. We will introduce legislation, which, if passed, would uh, make that happen, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, we are working to make sure that uh, rural customers who have very high delivery charges, Mr. Speaker, have an extra 12 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker, to uh, upwards of 20 percent. So we've taken action. We've also acted in terms of smaller companies, Mr. Speaker, that need support uh, through the Industrial um, Conservation Initiative, and they will be able to save up to 34 percent. So we've taken a number of initiatives, Mr. Answer. Speaker, because we know that people need that support. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, people in Ontario are having trouble paying their hydro bills, and they are at a breaking point. They're concerned that the Premier is making decisions that are more about the best headline instead of what's best for families. It was amazing that last Friday, Liberal staffers were handing out leaflets at subway stops talking about rebate legislation that was barely 12, year, 12 hours old. Speaker. It looks like this is more about helping the Liberal Party than it is about helping families. Will this Premier start making this about people instead of making it about her party? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the decisions that we have made to help people with their electricity bills are about people, Mr. Speaker. It's about their lives every day, helping people in the same way, Mr. Speaker, that the 100,000 childcare spaces that we're going to create is about people, Mr. Speaker. It's about people when we uh, move to make tuition free for low-income families. All of those decisions, Mr. Speaker, all of those choices that we have made as a government are in response to people's concerns, and they are about helping people to deal with their lives every single day, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, I was at the plowing match yesterday. I know the Premier and lots of her team were there too, and so were a lot of unhappy Ontarians. They showed the Premier that her plan to privatize Hydro One has absolutely no public support and underlined that this government has no mandate to privatize. The next election, Speaker. The next election is 20 months away, at which point the Premier has an opportunity to actually get a mandate from the people. In the meantime, this Premier needs to stop selling shares in Hydro One. Will the Premier commit today to stop any further sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the, uh, the leader of the third party for that question. Um, for us on this side of the House, we recognize how important it is to continue with jobs and growth and investment, and the broadening of Hydro One will just do that, Mr. Speaker. And of course, when you're talking about 
the three pillar plan that we brought forward to help families. We want to see that implemented as fast as we can, Mr. Speaker, so people and families can continue to save on their bills. And I thought I heard that from the third party before, Mr. Speaker. But when I brought forward unanimous consent to get my legislation passed quickly, you know what happened, Mr. Speaker? They voted against it. Shame on them, Mr. Speaker. We want to ensure we help families, and they're not helping us all and the families in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question, my next, uh, my next uh, question, Speaker, is uh, for the Premier as well. Not only do they not have a mandate, Speaker, the government is being sued for its decision to sell off Hydro One. Flyers that the Liberals were handing out last week were more about politics, Speaker, than they were about people. Ontarians want to believe, Speaker, that things are going to get better, but the government keeps making decisions that favour the Liberal Party instead of people. Will this Premier start taking action that puts people ahead of her party's interests? So, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the investments that we are making in people's lives around the province, whether it's in transit, Mr. Speaker, whether it's in roads, bridges, whether it's in Hamilton or whether it's in uh, Mississauga or whether it's in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's in Thunder Bay, those investments are about supporting people in their communities to allow them to create the jobs, to create the economic growth that we know is necessary for them to thrive and for their communities to thrive. We can't do that, Mr. Speaker, if we don't have the resources to invest in that infrastructure. And so that is the decision that we made, Mr. Speaker. And I, I think the, uh, the leader of the third party knows full well that the decisions we made that we brought forward in the throne speech to reduce electricity costs by removing uh, the the uh, provincial portion of the HST is a recognition, Mr. Speaker, that people need help with their Thank electricity. Well, Speaker, the government should be about uh, helping people and working to address their problems. Absolutely, it shouldn't be about looking after the Liberal Party. So my question is: Will this premier stop any further privatization of Hydro One until the people of this province actually get to have a say? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank uh, the member for that question. Obviously, uh, I can't comment directly on this as there's a legal process that's now underway, and we need to allow that process to unfold. It's also important to note, Mr. Speaker, that the Integrity Commissioner has already looked into this and has recently confirmed that there was no wrongdoing. But I think it's important to, to mention, Mr. Speaker, that the NDP took over $33,000 from QPR, its affiliates, in 2015, and so far they've reported almost $12,000 in 2016. Oh, Mr. Speaker, now they trot out there for a press conference to attack the government's plan to invest in transit, in transportation, and other infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. So uh, top NDP fundraisers are launching a lawsuit, Mr. Speaker. We've even seen Toronto Danforth NDP Electoral District collect over $3,100 yes, from various QP locals. Wow. So, Mr. Speaker, I beg the question: Is the member for Toronto Danforth selling you. access to the media studio? Thank you. As I confirmed, the member will withdraw. Withdraw. Final supplementary. Speaker, the unmitigated gall of this government and its cabinet ministers are un is unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Look, in the days prior to the throne speech, Speaker, the government was saying that. The, the minister. The, The Minister of Municipal Affairs is warned.
Uh, as a reminder, the next one is uh, named. Final supplement. In the days prior to the Liberal throne speech, Speaker, the government was saying that they finally understood hydro bills were too high. They told people to expect big changes, and people were hopeful, Speaker. Instead, what should have been a first step, giving people a bit of a break, was the only step. People hoping for action get, got yet another letdown by this government, Speaker. Why did the Liberals not use the opportunity to make a real difference and stop the sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's important to mention that we're getting value for the sale and the broadening of hydro ownership, and we're investing in transit, in infrastructure. Recently, I was able to tour the north part of our province and make announcements in Kapiskasing, in North Bay, out in areas like Cochrane. We're talking about the investments that we're making in this province that are creating jobs and growth, Mr. Speaker, and that's what the people of Ontario want. When you're talking about the three-point plan, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When you're talking about the three-point plan, the Ontario Rebate for Electricity Consumers Act, that permanent act, that uh, the permanent rebate that we're putting in is going to help families with an 8% rebate to 5 million families in Ontario, residential consumers, and along with small businesses and farms. Mr. Speaker, we're getting the job done, and we're working for Ontario families. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister, in December 2015, Ontario's Auditor General released a report into the billions of dollars worth of corporate grants doled out to Ontario companies over the past 10 years by this Liberal government. As you know, the report stated, the Ministry of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure has not attempted to measure whether the $1.4 billion it provided to Ontario businesses since 2004 actually strengthened the economy or made recipients more competitive. As a result of this scathing report, I wrote to you 250 days ago asking you to release the information on the grants your office has funded and the companies your office has funded since 2004. Minister, I still haven't heard back from you on this important matter. Why won't you share with Ontario's taxpayers what it is they're paying for? Mr. Speaker, the member might uh, might want to check the website of Treasury Board because you'll find information on Treasury Board that outlines uh, the investments we've made since January 2013. It's just been recently posted uh, and outlines that, Mr. Speaker, in a report on our Jobs and Prosperity Fund, 68,501 jobs have been created in this province in the last three years alone through the investments we've made. Now, the question I have. Is, uh, is, the, is this member in line with his leader? Because, Mr. Speaker, this party has denigrated the investments we've made that have created 160,000 uh, jobs since uh, 2003, yet their leader supported some of those investments when he was in Ottawa. Are you, is, is the leader sending out letters to some people in the province saying he supports our business investments and at the same time authorizing his credit to get up and denigrate them? Answer. Mr. Speaker, I think we've got a case of the scarecrow situation from the Wizard of Oz. He doesn't know what direction he's Thank going you. in. The critic probably doesn't. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister, this is about accountability and transparency and standing up for the taxpayers of this province. Of the billions per year in business support programs flowing from your Liberal government, we know that the Minister is making no real effort to ensure taxpayers are getting value for money. Much of that money was spent with no public application process or criteria, and instead the Minister and the Premier handpicked the companies that would receive the payouts behind closed doors by invitation only. Speaker, all this leaves taxpayers wondering, will the Minister come clean and finally release this information, or is there something that this Liberal government is trying to hide from the taxpayers of this province? Mr. Speaker, the, the information from 2013 is now available. I, I told the member that in the original question, so go online, 
You'll find the information you're looking for. Information before 2013 will be made available. It's part of our open data process where we're open up this information. But, Mr. Speaker, that party continues to denigrate the important investments we're making with our business community. Just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, we had a great announcement coming out of Oshawa, GM. 3,000 workers in this province, Mr. Speaker, will be retaining their jobs in the auto sector, something you said wasn't going to happen. Mr. Speaker, that party wanted us to close those plants. We're going to keep them open. We're going to keep fighting for the auto sector. We're going to keep fighting with our business supports to create jobs right across this province. Thank you. New question. Member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour la première. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Shamefully shows that 90 percent of the residents, including the children of Gracinero and Wabasimong, First Nation, show sign of mercury poisoning. It took Japanese researcher, not this government, to provide the only public data on the health effect of mercury poisoning on the people of Gracinero and Wabasimong. In May, you committed $300,000 to immediately begin field work. Will the Premier show the local people what has been done, how much has been spent, and what samples have been taken so far? Because we can't find none. Thank you. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, we in Ontario we are listening to Grassy Narrows. We take their concerns very, very carefully. We have just received this report yesterday, September 20th, from the Japanese team headed up by Professor Hanada. Uh, we will uh, continue working with the community and the federal government on this important issue. I can tell you by way of background that earlier this summer, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change and I visited Grassy Narrows. We met with Chief Fulbister. We set in place a plan to review these issues broadly. We set in a political team consisting of the Minister of uh, Environment and Climate Change and myself and Chief Fulbister to review the technical work of the, of the team. The uh, report from the Japanese scientific team was received yesterday. Our government is reviewing it Answer. carefully today. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier Speaker. Well, the Environment Minister amazingly stood in this House last week and told me, and I quote, I can't imagine we could be doing more, end of quote, when questioned about Grassy Narrow. Well, Chief Fobister certainly thinks, seems to think that Ontario could be doing way more. The people of Grassy Narrow think that we could be doing way more. The people of Wabisun think that we could be doing way more. World-renowned scientists, Ontarian, we all think that this Premier, this government, could be doing way more. The question is simple, Speaker. Will the Premier follow the lead of the Japanese, clean up the English Wabigun River of the mercury so that the people can drink the water and eat the fish? Thank you. Thank you. We all want to fix this problem. In yesterday's report from the Japanese scientists headed by the, uh, Dr. Hanada, he himself said in the report, and I quote, and this goes to the issue of conflicting scientific and engineering approaches to the problem, and I quote, Dr. Hanada said, it is possible that things get worse because of the turning of the soil and the water. Broadly speaking, there are two approaches to this problem. One, to disturb the sediment on the bottom of the river and remove the mercury that is settled uh, to a depth below the, the silt level. And uh, there are other approaches also. Dr. Hanada himself has said that uh, following his report, we have to do more work to review and get the best scientific and the best engineering Answer. solution to this problem. Thank you. New question, the member from Durham. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister, there was absolutely wonderful news on Monday night with regards to a tentative agreement between Unifor and General Motors. The news was warmly welcome in my riding of Durham. I've heard from countless constituents about the importance of this to them especially with regards to jobs staying in Ontario. 
We have seen positive growth in our economy over the past two years. But, Minister, what does this deal specifically mean for Ontarians and our economy? Mr. Mr. Speaker, this is fantastic news for the people of Durham and people right across this province. It's a tremendous endorsement, Mr. Speaker, of Ontario's competitive advantage. We're very pleased with this uh, tentative agreement, enabling new product investments to be made at GM facilities across Ontario. GM's Oshawa plant will be getting a new product mandate, something that we've been seeking for some time. And there'll also be extended mandates for the engine plant in St. Catharines and the distribution facility as well in Woodstock. This government has been a fierce advocate for our auto sector, Mr. Speaker. Ontario has significant competitive advantages, a highly skilled, educated workforce, the most advanced technology in North America, and a government willing to be a champion for advanced manufacturing and innovation. We're working together with GM and Unifor to build Ontario yes, up. This is a terrific example of what can happen when companies, unions, and governments work together to build this province up build our sector up and create jobs across Supplementary. This is wonderful news, Minister, and shows that Ontario is truly leading the way when it comes to advanced manufacturing in the auto sector. With almost 4,000 jobs protected, this deal means a lot to our workers for their job security and for the local communities. Investments like the one outlined in the tentative agreement means a lot more workers and families in my riding as well as all across Ontario. Can you tell us more about how this news will impact other workers, their families and all Ontarians? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, unlike some of the opposition, we're incredibly pleased with the positive news for thousands of General Motors workers and their families, especially in Oshawa, St. Catharines and Woodstock. This invest investment also secures tens of thousands of jobs in our, our burgeoning auto parts sector, Mr. Speaker, and well beyond. The tentative deal between Unifor and GM is about ensuring that our high-skilled workers have high-quality, well-paying jobs and job security in the coming years. But, Mr. Speaker, this does stand in dark contrast to the opposition, who would have let that auto sector die on the vine. Unlike the opposition, our government has stood and continues to stand with the auto sector. Unlike the PCs, Mr. Speaker, who said, and I quote, just let those plants close, this government supports this auto sector. We will continue to support them going forward. We're pleased with the steady growth of our manufacturing yes, sector. We're thrilled with these incre increasing investments in the auto sector, and we're very excited by the jobs that they're, they're sustaining and creating. Thank you, Mr. No question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. This is the second time in as many weeks I've had to question the Liberal government for dragging its heels on openness and transparency. Last week, the Minister of Transportation refused to name a secret panel on the GTA West Highway. Today, he sits on test results of the largest bridge failure in Ontario's history. Speaker, January's $106 million Nipigon Bridge failure, 42 days after opening, tore up a vital trade conduit between East and West and split Canada in two. While the minister quickly pointed to bull testing to find the cause of the failure, it's now nine months later. The National Research Council and Western University completed their testing in July, and the minister has results, but he's refused to make them public. Will the premier tell us why she's allowed her minister of transportation to keep the vital Nipigon Bridge Question. failure test results secret from the public for wow. months? Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. A uh, couple of things I wanted to point out. I've, I've said from day one that the most important thing for people, not just in northern Ontario, uh, but for people right across Ontario, is to, uh, is to have uh, the entirety of the information flowing back to them with respect to what took place on the Nipigon River Bridge. We, we all uh, recognize that it was a very challenging situation a number of months ago when the bridge malfunctioned. I'm happy to report, as I did at that time, that the Ministry of Transportation, working very closely uh, with the affected communities and our First Nation partners, moved very quickly to make sure that a temporary repair was put back in place, Speaker, so that both lanes of the bridge at that point in time could be reopened. Though both of those lanes have remained open since that point in time, Speaker. I've also committed in the past, and I'll reiterate it today, today uh, that, uh, that when we are in a position to release the, all of the findings Answer. with respect to all of the tests and analysis, uh, we'll be happy to do so. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Yeah. 
Okay, well, there you have it, Speaker. Instead of releasing the results, the government continues to stonewall public requests. That's because they know, like those in Northern Ontario know, that this was not only the largest bridge failure in Ontario's history, it's their government's failure, a $106 million failure. The minister has sat on these results all summer, and his silence does nothing to answer questions as to how, after spending $106 million on a vanity bridge project, it could have failed so quickly. Were there other options? Did the government rush the design before an election? Was there any oversight on this project? And can motorists trust that the first bridge failure will, in fact, be the last? The people of Ontario are owed an explanation today. Will the Premier Question. lift the veil of secrecy and order the release of test results into the Nipigon Bridge failure immediately? Well, yes, behind that, Minister. Well, uh, th thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for the follow-up question. I I, I've had the chance to be up in the Nipigon area, and, and let me take a quick moment, uh, Speaker, to pay tribute to my colleague, uh, the member from Thunder Bay, uh, from Thunder, who represents that community, the minister who has uh, stood alongside me and has been a strong champion for his community on this file and so many other Speaker. I've had the chance, along with many of those on this side of the House, to be in Nipigon and to be in communities around Nipigon, Speaker. I'm not quite so. I'm not quite certain that the members, the people who live in that part of our beautiful province, would take kindly to that Conservative member calling this a vanity project. I think that was the term that he just used a second ago, Speaker. On this side of the House, uh, Speaker, this Premier and our team recognize that in every corner of Ontario, there is a requirement, there is an obligation to continue to build up the infrastructure that we need for a brighter future and for a stronger economy, Speaker. This is work that we take seriously. We don't consider yes, building up Northern Ontario an exercise in vanity. We consider it the right thing to do for the people of this province. Thanks so much, Speaker. Your question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Rural Ontarians now pay the highest hydro rates in all of Canada and the continental United States. I think the Premier heard some disappointment at the ploughing match on this issue. Over the summer, Francesca Dobbin, the Executive Director of the United Way of Bruce Gray, declared rural energy poverty to be a crisis. But the Minister of Energy refused to call this a crisis. In fact, he said he didn't know how many Ontarians were behind on their electricity bills, or even if the province collects such data. Well, it does. About 567,000 households were behind on their bills as of December 31, 2015, up by about 94,000 households from 2013. Question. How many families are in arrears right now? Wow. Thank you. Minister Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the uh, member for the question because I think the important thing to recognize is that there are 330,000 families in this province that live in the rural areas that are going to be getting this benefit that we introduced in our three-part pillar plan. Mr. Speaker, $110 million in additional funding and support for rural and northern customers, Mr. Speaker, as well as increasing access for these families. We're seeing their bills drop, Mr. Speaker, by, on average, $45 a month or over $500 a year. And, Mr. Speaker, that's on top of, Mr. Speaker, it is so important to emphasize that we've got the OESP program in place. We've got many other things for families in northern Ontario and rural areas, Mr. Speaker, that I understand that some of them are having difficulty. I live in the north, Mr. Speaker. Answer. I hear from them, and we've ensured that we put this in place because we heard what they're saying, and we're continuing to act and help Thank these you. families, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Energy, about 60,000 Ontario families were cut off from their electricity in 2015. Terrible. The minister doesn't blame rising hydro rates. He blames the families. In rural Ontario, when you lose your electricity, you don't just lose your lights. You could also lose power to your well pump. It means you lose drinking water. It means you lose your shower and your toilet. This happened to a 74-year-old pensioner in MacArthur Mills this summer. She was not the only one. Instead of blaming families, Will the minister guarantee that rural Ontarians who can't pay their skyrocketing hydro bills don't lose access to the basic necessities of life? 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we're continuing to work with the OEB on finding ways that we continue to help and, and, and look at distribution costs and many things to help rural families. Because I know, Mr. Speaker, as a government, we are well aware that uh, rural families are paying a, a disproportionate more for the supply of electricity into the areas. That's why we brought forward this 20 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. That's why I had the opportunity to meet with um, the United Way Executive Director in uh, Bruce County. We had a very good meeting to ensure that we could talk about all the programs that are benefiting and helping rural families, Mr. Speaker. But I find it interesting, Mr. Speaker, that we're doing everything we possibly can to ensure that the aggressive timeline to pass this legislation that I introduced last week, Mr. Speaker, that we want to get this done so we can ensure families get this rebate, Mr. Speaker. But unfortunately, when I asked for unanimous consent to pass it, the opposition voted against it, Mr. Speaker. New question. New question. Member from Lancaster, Dundas. Uh, Speaker, uh, thank you. Westdale. Speaker, I have an important question for the Minister of Finance. Minister, today it was announced that the Ontario government has signed a memorandum of understanding, MOU, to facilitate the restructuring of U.S. Steel Canada Inc. Let's get the details. Speaker. It's no, well, that's interesting. That's my question, actually. Speaker, it's no secret that the government has continued to support the best possible outcome for pension members and other stakeholders under very difficult circumstances. Minister, can you confirm the signing of this MOU? And if so, can you provide specific details related to the proposed deal? I appreciate the question from the member. I know it's a, a question that pertains also to all of us in the House, especially those from Hamilton, who are paying close attention. I've been working closely with this side of the House to try to find a way to come to a resolution. And, Mr. Speaker, it's indeed true that the Government of Ontario and Bedrock Industries Group today we have announced that they have signed a, memor a memorandum of understanding. The MOU is an important step forward with the completion of restructuring intended to protect jobs, the ongoing operation of USS Steel Hamilton and Lake Erie facilities, the pensions and post-employment benefits for active and retired U.S. Steel employees. The terms of the MOU remain confidential until they can be released pursuant to the court process. We've also agreed to support the development of the industrial lands in an effort to promote the economic development of the Hamilton region while ensuring that the environment continues to be protected. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Here, here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I'm pleased to hear that this memorandum of understanding has been reached between Bedrock and the government. I'm also pleased to hear of the government's ongoing commitment to protect jobs, pensions, and post-employment benefits for active and retired U.S. Steel employees. Mr. Speaker, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Finish, please. This is good news, Mr. Speaker. I'm just trying to be helpful. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance please share details of Bedrock's commitment to offering well-paying, long-term jobs and benefits to U.S. Steel employees? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, again, I appreciate the question from the member. I appreciate the engagement by the member opposite, who's also been leading in terms of trying to put us uh, in a position where we can start finding ways to restructure uh, the situation in Hamilton. Bedrock's principals have a strong track record of owning and successfully operating businesses in the metals, mining, and manufacturing and distribution sectors worldwide, including Canada. And Bedrock has been committed to working with all stakeholders, including organized labor, salaried workers, government, and affected communities, to provide well-paying, long-term jobs and benefits, as well as pursuing continuous improvement and ongoing financial strength. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to note that the MOU and the contemplated restructuring remain subject to many, many conditions. So we're hopeful that this will clear the way for a restructuring Answer. process that results in a viable, healthy company that supports continued operations in Ontario and in our local economies. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any question the member from here on Bruce? Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday at the International Plowing Match, the Speaker spoke of the importance of Ontario's agri-food industry. She spoke of how we need to support our farmers. Well, Speaker, 
The Premier has an opportunity to do just that. She can direct her caucus to support my private member's bill, which has received unanimous acknowledgement from provincial stakeholders that the regulations associated with rest the restricted use of neonicotinoids are not workable. Yeah. My PMB is the result of consultations with people who know best, people who would rather invest their money into growing their business rather than the pay the high price of admission to a Liberal pay-to-play dinner. Speaker, I ask the Premier, will she support Bill 4 tomorrow? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member from Huron-Bruce uh, uh, for her question this morning. I did take the opportunity uh, just last week uh, to meet with the Honourable Member uh, regarding Bill 4, supporting Agro experts in the Field Act 2016. Our government, of course, at this particular time, we're actively uh, uh, reviewing this bill. I always want to make clear, as I did to my good friends at the GFO just yesterday, when I had a great conversation with Mark Brock, Ontario Farmers Ken, when we demonstrate the need to continue to have access to neonic trees in the province of Ontario. And we all know, Mr. Speaker, that in order to maintain the agricultural food sector in Ontario, $36.6 billion to Ontario's GDP each and every year, healthy pollinators are an essential part of that agricultural economy, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Back to the Premier. And, Speaker, they're reviewing these regulations because they know they're not workable. My private member's bill fixes it. Just yesterday, the Premier told the massive audience at the IPM that she does not condone divisive politics. But to some, very close to this particular issue would suggest that that is exactly what she has done with the neonic reg regulations. Speaker, tomorrow, the Premier has an opportunity to walk her talk. She has an opportunity to actually support her own challenge to create more jobs in the agri-food industry. She has the opportunity to recognize the great strides the industry itself has taken to remedy this very issue. And she has the opportunity to reduce red tape. And most importantly, she has the opportunity to support Ontario's agri-food industry. Or, Speaker, will the Premier continue to Question. ignore farmers throughout this province? Speaker, will the Premier tomorrow support Bill 4? Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, thank the Honourable Member for supplementary question. So, when you look at the uh, uh, the success we're achieving to date, the Premier's Agri-Food Challenge, uh, 120,000 new jobs uh, uh, by the year 2020, we're well on the track uh, to uh, to achieve that goal. Uh, just yesterday, I had the opportunity, as I did, I want to thank the uh, Schneider family for their warm hospitality yesterday at the IPM. But, Mr. Chairman, I want, Mr. Speaker, I want to re-emphasize that having a healthy pollinator aspect of Ontario's agricultural economy is so very important to our 52,000 family farms, the 780,000 people uh, that work in this sector today, to make agriculture one of Canada's Answer. leading agricultural drivers in this province today, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Parents and students began this school year with hope that things would be better, but September isn't even over and the government is letting them down yet again. Three weeks in and thousands of students still don't have a school bus to get them to and from school. Those that do make it to school sit in rooms that are sweltering in the summer and exceptionally cold in the winter. People know that Conservatives cut and privatized, but that's not what Ontarians voted for. Is the minister ready to stop pointing fingers and start taking action so that young people can get the education that they need? Thank you, Thank you Speaker. And, uh, Speaker, I've been out uh, the last few weeks uh, visiting our excellent schools across this province. Did a great job, I've been too. to schools in Hamilton, I've been to schools in Barrie, I've been to schools in Guelph, I've been to schools um, right across, Speaker. And I know that, that our teachers, and all of our education workers are working together to make sure that students in Ontario get the best education possible. Mr. Speaker, I want to see kids in schools, in classrooms, learning, Absolutely. not waiting at bus stops. Mr. Speaker, 
I have been in touch with the chairs of the school board, with the directors, and they are working with the consortiums, with the school bus operators, to resolve this issue. Yes, we are three weeks into the school year, and yes, there are still Answer. some students that have a delay in their pickup, but we're working together to ensure that we resolve this issue on behalf Thank of our you. students. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, you had all summer to get the busing issue sorted out. Families and education workers feel overwhelmed by an education system that is reaching a tipping point. Students in Mississauga and Peterborough are being taught French and music from a cart when it should be done in a classroom. Three weeks after the school year began, students are starting their school days late, or in some cases, and not just a few students, Minister, in some cases not starting the school day at all because they aren't, there aren't enough school buses to get them to school. The minister says that she is focused on and monitoring the situation. People need to see changes now. When will parents and students see the minister step up and stop talking about the problem and start fixing it? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And um, you know, I just want to thank the member opposite for that question. And there was a lot in there to unpack. I want to focus on uh, French and uh, and what we're doing because we're very committed to ensuring that we have the supports in our classroom for all of our students. That's true. And we're very dedicated to French. In fact, um, you know, it's either the the teacher goes to the student or the students go to the teacher. And some boards and some schools have decided that it's best that the teacher come to the students. You know, because. It is all about focusing on the well-being of our students and ensuring that they get the supports. Mr. Speaker, I will not take lessons from that party opposite. In your platform, you were proposing to cut $600 million from education and from health care. In this province, you have no plan for education at all. So we are focused. The, uh, <laughs> start the clock. The uh, minister would have known that I was standing had she addressed the chair. So those are the two things I want to remind the minister of, and everybody. No question, the member from Burnaby Springfield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Our government has often stressed the importance of providing transportation options that help Ontarians get to where they need to be sooner. I know that the traffic on Ontario's highways is a struggle for many people across the province. And while I know that we are working hard to get Ontarians off the road with investments in transit, it seems to me that we, we, will st we can still be doing more to ease gridlock for those travelling by car. We must recognize the different ways Ontarians choose to get around and make those options work for them. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation please let members of this House know how our government is working to reduce gridlock on Ontario's highways? Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member from Brampton Springdale for asking such an important question, as she always does. As the Minister of Transportation, I know how important it is for us as a government to make transportation and investments that make it easier for Ontarians to get around. As the member said, this includes investments in transit, but of course also innovation and creativity with respect to Ontario's highways. And that is why I'm pleased to announce that of last Thursday, high occupancy toll lanes are now open in both directions on the QEW between Trafalgar Road and Oakville and Guelph Line in Burlington. Vehicles with an HOT lane permit will now be able to use this stretch of highway for a small fee, while vehicles with two or more occupants can still drive in the lane for free. And we are taking this step forward without removing any general purpose lanes. Ontario has always been a leader speaker, and we are continuing that tradition now as the first province in Canada Answer. to implement HOT lanes. Thank you.
Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. This is an exciting day in Ontario, not only for those who currently have HOT permits. I know that HOT lanes have been a point of interest for your ministry and that many Ontarians were happy to see the success of high occupancy vehicle lanes during the Pan Para Pan Am Games last summer. Mr. Speaker, I'm aware that this phase of the pilot, there were 500 permits issued, and I know that there's been a lot of interest, including amongst those who did not obtain a permit this round. That is why I'm sure that many in the GTHA are eager to know about the, the future of this pilot. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House of, as to how many commuter, how commuters can apply for an HOT permit in the future? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very, much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank the member for her follow-up question. I am pleased to announce that our government received more than 3,400 applications for the HOT lanes pilot, and through a randomized draw, Speaker, we awarded 500 permits this term. I understand that there is incredible interest in the pilot, but I also know that there are individuals who are unable to get a permit this time around. I say to those commuters, Speaker, do not despair. Permits last for three months, and drivers will be able to apply for next term's permits as early as November 1st. Those interested in participating should also know that future permit draws could award up to 1,000 HOT permits. I strongly encourage all commuters who are interested to reapply in November to our exciting new pilot speaker. Our government is truly committed to increasing travel options for Ontarians, and we are pleased to see that people across the province are as excited about the HOT yes, lanes pilot as we are. Thanks very much. Fighting the war on human sex trafficking is more needed now than ever before. This summer, I travelled to North Bay, Sudbury, Belleville, Peterborough, Kenora, Kitchener-Waterloo, Cambridge and Windsor to hear and share information with police, service providers and concerned citizens about the continuing uncovering and alarming growth rate of this not-so-underground criminal activity. The volume of media coverage on this issue should alarm this government, but it goes far beyond that. I continually hear from parents and grandparents scared out of their minds, worried it could be their child or grandchild next. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier explain why victims and service providers are still waiting on meaningful details of a comprehensive plan? Minister responsible for women's issues. Minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for the important question and the work she's uh, done this summer on uh, addressing this very serious issue of human trafficking. I, too, spent my summer uh, very focused on this issue, further to our announcement of our human trafficking strategy in June of this year. And uh, Just last week, Speaker, I was in Edmonton, as I shared with the member opposite last week, at a federal, provincial, uh, territorial uh, conference, and I put human trafficking on the agenda to talk about what we're doing here in Ontario in terms of our strategy and, uh, what, uh, and to learn, to learn, Speaker, from other provinces that have done some good work in this area as well. As the member knows, our strategy is focused on four pillars, provincial coordination and leadership, prevention and community Answer. support, enhanced justice sector in initiatives, and Indigenous-led supports. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, Manitoba, having one-tenth the population of Ontario, spends over $10 million a year battling a human sex trafficking because they get it. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier again, it's clear this government is not serious about human sex trafficking legislation when they continue to drive the agenda for their own gain. This gamemanship has to stop. Frontline service providers and workers are exasperated, and there is still nothing advancing the law to support them in fighting this horrific crime. Will the Premier commit now to passing Saving the Girl Next Door Act, which I'm reintroducing today, so Ontario will finally have legislation that will make a difference? Thank you. Minister? Thank you, Speaker. Well, I'm not sure if our House Leader has called that bill back up, but I just want to say that this government takes human trafficking very seriously. We are working very hard on this issue. 
Our strategy speaker focuses on first and foremost on supporting survivors. That's critically important to us. We need to raise the wish, raise awareness of the issue of human trafficking because we know a lot of people don't recognize it happens right here in our province and in our country. And secondly, we need to hold those traffickers Order. accountable for this deplorable crime. Our strategy um, addresses that, Speaker. And we need to work across our government with the Minister of uh, Community Safety and uh, Correctional Services, the Attorney General, the Minister of Community and Social Services, and we need to work with our Answer. municipal uh, leaders and police forces as well as the federal government to combat this terrible crime. Thank you. Thank you. My question is for the Premier. I'm going to table another bill today regarding uh, the French University. And uh, from uh, the throne speech, everybody was deceived and frustrated because there was nothing in the speech. How long Francophones will have to wait before the Premier does something about it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I wish to thank the member for Nicole Bell for the work. I wish to say to the all Francophones that the things uh, go ahead. We are putting uh, in place a committee and a bill that will table to wants to accelerate the process. But if we want to be responsible, we must do the things correctly. We want to make sure that our children and grandchildren can attend French University. We want this uh, project be viable, that uh, all Francophone bilingual and wish to pursue uh, post-secondary schools. Uh, we are putting in place the right things and to take the best decision possible for that franco ontarian uh, benefit from this program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A planning committee is not what we're asking. What we're asking, it's a committee, a transition committee for governance for and by franco ontarians that will make, um, we can uh, manage our elementary school and secondary school and college. Why are we not able to manage a university? We need a transition committee by and for, for uh, by Franco Ontario. When will the government decide to do something about it? Mr. Speaker, I mentioned before that our government takes uh, this fire very seriously. It's one of our priorities. We are putting in place a planning committee that will help us to buy franco ontarian for franco ontarian to the decision. Our commitment is there since the beginning. It's been done for years, and we're very close to make announcements that will show franco ontarians uh, that our uh, commitment to this project. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Now, as we all know, new technology advancements are playing a very important role in, in, in advancing the way people can access all services around government. And my question to the Attorney General is how are we using technology to advance access in our court systems so that people can readily get the information they need, file court orders, etc.? Thank, thank you very much. The Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Beaches East York for asking this very important question. First of all, um, uh, uh, Speaker, it's, it's a great honor to be the Attorney General of the Province of Ontario. Uh, something I had not thought 20 years ago when I started law school that I'll have the opportunity to do, and uh, uh, honored to serve in that role. Uh, Speaker, one of the most important things in the role of ex uh, as the Attorney General is to ensure that uh, that access to justice uh, uh, remains a very important priority for the government, and the member is correct. We have an opportunity to move forward and introduce more digital innovation into the justice system. Initiatives like offering electronic filings for small claims available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
providing parents with the option to go online to set up straightforward child support payments from the comfort of their own homes. And speak of course, putting daily court lists online so people can easily search where and when they need to go to court. Increasing remote video capacity in our yes, bail courts and correctional institutions. And speaker, working with our justice sector partners to replace costly, time-consuming and paper-based tally warrants with e-tally warrants. Speaker, there's more to do, and this is just Thank the you. beginning. Thank you. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change has been made in the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Mr. Clark assumes ballot item number 38 and Mr. McNaughton uh, assumes ballot item number 67. We have a deferred vote for the motion to address the reply of the speech from the throne. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute vote.
Honourable members, please take your seats. Thank you. Merci. On September the 13th, 2016, Ms. Wynne moved, second reading, Ms. Nehidu Harris, seconded by Ms. Nehidu Harris, that a humble address be presented to her honour, the Lieutenant Governor, as follows. To the Honourable Elizabeth Doswell, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, we, Her Majesty's most dutiful and loyal subjects, the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, the Province of Ontario now assembled, beg leave to thank Your Honour for the gracious speech Your Honour has pleased has been pleased to address to us at the opening of the present session. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. 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 Bradley, Mr. Del Duca, Ms. Sanders, Mr. Souza, Mr. Mr. Ms. Matthews, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. 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 Dugan, Ms. McCharles, Ms. McCharles, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Gravel, Mr. Gravel, Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Couteau, Mr. Couteau, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Leo, Mr. Leo, Mr. Tebow, Mr. Tebow, Mr. Orzetti, Mr. Quadri, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga, Ms. Manga, Mr. Kraft, Mr. Madame Lalonde, Madame Lalonde, Ms. Dahmer, Ms. Ms. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Ms. Jassen, Ms. Jassen, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Ms. Albanese, Ms. Albanese, Mrs. McMahon, Ms. McMahon, Mr. Bowler, Mr. Bowler, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Wong, Ms. Wong, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Renault, Mr. Ms. Vernil. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. 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 Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller. Perry Salmon. Mr. Miller. Perry Salmon. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe. Mr. McDonald. Mr. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Van. Mr. Van. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. De Novo. De Novo. Ms. De Novo. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Angelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Ms. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 52, the nays are 39. The ayes being 52 and the nays being 39, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that a humble address be presented to Her Honour the Lieutenant Governor as follows. To the Honourable Elizabeth Dodswell, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, we, Her Majesty's most dutiful and loyal subjects, the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Ontario, now assembled, beg leave to thank Your Honour for the gracious speech Her Honour has been pleased to address at the opening of the present session. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.